Hello, my name is Wendy Storms, and this is my presentation on the inverse design of fabricable integrated photonics. Uh, my mentor for this project has been Dr. Zi Jing Wang, and this work supported by the Department of Energy National Nuclear Security Administration under award number <clears throat> DENA00003857. So, start, so the first part of the project, project is, of course, integrated photonics. And uh, photonic integrated photonic circuits are similar to electro electric circuits, but use photons instead of electrons. So they are small because they are working with light, which is incredibly small wavelengths. So these can be very small and relatively cheap to manufacture. Uh, they're currently used in data comms, like fiber optic cables, because the information can travel very quickly along these wires uh, at the speed of light, because we're working with light, uh, and also with very little crosstalk between the cables. So they're great for especially like long distance cables. Um, and there are also future uses for photonic circuits, for, uh, including LiDAR, uh, which is sensing for autonomous vehicles and quantum computing. Uh, so then we go on to how do we design these photonic parts? We do so using inverse design. Um, so in normal design, which is called forwards design, we start with an intuition of how a specific part should look. Um, so example, a Y branch. Okay, we have our intuition that a Y branch should look like a Y. So we design our Y branch based on that intuition. And then at the end, we take our prototype, test the prototype and test the, the, the output to what the theory said. Um, now this can take a long time. You have to go through many iterations of your project um, because of course not a lot of them aren't gonna be right on the first try. So you have to spend a lot of time fine tuning what you have. Well, inverse design, you start with the output. So you use a computer algorithm and you essentially tell it, this is, here are materials parameters and here are some geometry parameters that are optimizable and can be changed by the program. And then you also tell it, here's the desired output uh, in the form of a figure of merit. And you can uh, give it like a target. I want, I want the transmission to be this value at this point. And then you, and then you join the program and at the end, your program will come up with a design. Uh, this uh, is faster and cheaper than forwards design because you don't have to iterate through so many uh, different types. Uh, and it can also come up with non-intuitive designs. So something that a human just wouldn't think of to make their shape. Um, and down here at the bottom, I have an illustration of sort of the process of doing inverse design. This is from Lumericals website. Lumerical is the program that I use, I've been using to do this research. Uh, so you start by defining your base simulation, defining your optimizable uh, geometry, and then you run the optimization and it outputs some new, some new geometry, which you can then test in Lumerical. Um, so to keep, but so the um, inverse design is certainly good, but requires the computer and that can take a lot of computing power. Uh, one way to limit this is the adjoint method, which uses gradient. So uh, your figure merit essentially creates a surface uh, like so. Picture down here, this picture is also from the miracle.com. Um, so the adjoint method takes gradients of the surface to decide which direction is the fastest rate of descent and then it moves their, your optimizable parameters in that direction of descent to maximize the figure of merit, which is your target. And so now I have just some pictures of some examples of inverse design. Uh, this is from one of the different designs I was testing or different sets of input parameters, should I say, that I was testing. Uh, so this is optimization zero. Most of these graphs are empty at this point and the geometry is just a very basic, vaguely Y-shaped thing. Here we have an optimization from the middle, optimization 10. And now we have a figure merit, which is increasing, which is what we want. The geometry is different. And this is not necessarily something someone would intuitively go, would intuitively think to make for a Y branch. It's very weird. It's very large here and very narrow over here. And now in here is the final optimization, optimization 23. 
Uh, again, our shape is now different and is still non-intuitive. Uh, and here the figure of merit increased until it leveled off. And that is what triggered the, um, pro the optimization program to stop once the figure of merit stops changing between different iterations or the change drops below a certain threshold. So I've been talking a lot about the figure of merit. What is it? Uh, the target, the figure of merit is the target that you want to minimize to get the result. Uh, in numerical, the figure of merit is related to the transmission. So how much power is at your source versus how much power is at your monitor. I'm not going to go into gory detail about this chunk of code, but this is where the target, of mer the figure of merit is calculated. And it is using this target T right here, which is your target transmission. And that is, and um, basic, and it uses this target transmission to calculate your figure of merit. And what I have been working on is changing that target to get a specific transmission spectrum. So that way I could say selectively exclude a specific wavelength. And so here are some of my results. So I have here is, this is the target that I fed into my program. I didn't feed it in as a graph, I fed it in as a function. So what this is, is this is an inverted Gaussian curve where it starts at a one, goes down to zero and goes back up to one. Um, and then over here is the transmission spectrum that, um, so I ran an optimization program using this function as my input, as my target. And this is, so this is the result. I took the geometry that Lumerical gave for that optimization and I, uh, whoops, and I tested its transmission spectrum and like this function, and so it doesn't say perfectly at one, but it's relatively small and then a large dip right in the middle where I expected it. And something to point out though, is that this dip does only go down to about 0 0.89, which I'll discuss in a little bit. And here, similar thing, except this time I used a sine function. So I have my, uh, my sine wave here, which is what I put in as my target. And out here, I have my output. And this function actually worked much better than the Gaussian function, where my dip now goes down to 0 0.7. And uh, so it even has that this dip is less shallow than this dip, which is true in the graph I plotted as well. Uh, so it's very nice. So some things I found is inverse design is a good design method because it's relatively fast and cheap. And especially for photonics, because uh, the physics with light can get very complicated. And this is uh, less complicated. You're making the computer do all the thinking, essentially. Uh, the figure of merit of an optimization can be changed to target a specific spectrum of data, which I showed in my results. Uh, one thing I will say about my results were a bit limited because I could only use shape optimization, which is where I give it those lines and it can move those lines around as opposed to topology optimization, which is where I give it a box and it decides which box will have materials or like which pixels in the box will have a material versus air. Or you could, um, but unfortunately topology optimization, which I do think could get better results, it just took too long to run on my computer. So in the interest of time, I used shape optimization and accepted that my results would not be as good as they could be. Uh, thank you very much for watching.